Would you fly on one? You won't fly on one. Would you fly one of these? Yeah, it's sketchy. I probably would, but I mean, I'm having that with you. A Lion Air Boeing 737 crashed into the sea this morning. Ethiopian Airlines flight has crashed. Two catastrophic crashes killed 346 people. On behalf of myself and the Boeing company, we are sorry. One message described the 737 MAX as a plane designed by clowns overseen by monkeys. I hear this boom. I look to my left and part of the plane is gone. At 16,000 feet, a door panel on Alaska Airlines Flight 1282 disappeared. The pilots said that their headsets were ripped off. There's a checklist up here. This thing gets blown out the door. We have confidence in the safety of our airplanes, and that's what all of this is about. And we fully understand the gravity. When the door blew off the Alaska flight, once again, the doors blew off Boeing. Tonight, we are learning more about events surrounding the death of the Boeing whistleblower, John Barnett. His death appears to be from a self-inflicted wound. A close family friend of Barnett says he predicted he might wind up dead, that a story could surface that he killed himself. But he told her, don't believe it. Today, I want to talk about Boeing. Now, <clears throat> I am sick, so my voice is much raspier than usual, but please bear with me. There's all these issues with Boeing, and then there was a whistleblower who was found dead, and they said that he took his own life, but people don't believe it. Well, some people don't believe it because they're like, he was in the middle of a lawsuit with them, giving a deposition. The testimony that he was giving was the testimony about them. He had already gone through their questioning, the Boeing attorneys, and now he was giving this explosive testimony. And so I want to do what I usually do on my channel, which is I want to give you guys the facts. And then we'll discuss the theories and then you can decide for yourself. This video is sponsored by Babbel. I did some French and now I'm doing Spanish. And I like learning Spanish because I feel like where I live, I actually can practice it. One of the things I learned is to say that I am learning Spanish. So, aprendo español. Si. <laughs> Muy fácil. If you want someone to repeat something, ¿puedes repetir? Si se puede. Hola. Hola. ¿Cuánto cuesta eso? Eso cuesta 18 dólares. ¿Puedes repetir, por favor? ¿Puedes repetir, por favor? Claro. Cuesta 18 dólares. No entiendo. Mm. Um, he's having a hard time, isn't he? ¿Es español? Sí, un poco. Un poco. Aprendo español. Oh, qué bueno. Mm, she's like, oh, qué bueno. $40. For me, it's so easy because you can just like pick it up whenever, wherever, do it real quick, and you actually can speak. They say, according to uh, scientists from Yale University and Michigan State University, that Babel is actually scientifically proven to have you speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. So if you guys are interested, they do have a promotion going on where you can get 60% off your subscription. Click the link in my description. Comment below what languages you want to learn. I'm curious to know. Thank you guys so much for watching and thank you to Babel for supporting my channel. Back to the video. By the way, the whistleblower, his name is John Barnett. He also went by Mitch and Swampy. To understand like what really went down, you need to get the context of the situation and the timing. Because a lot of questions that come up were people being like, well, why now? If he did take his own life or if they did take him out, why now? And I think when you look at the timeline as usual, things start to make a lot more sense. First of all, this, the timing of this lawsuit really could not have been more worse for Boeing because although it started in 2017, 
There were all these delays, and this was actually an appeal that Barnett was filing because the case got dismissed, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But what you have to understand is that in January of this year, there was this incident that happened with Alaska Airlines where the do, do, the door flew off the plane. The oxygen masks that came down uh, were not working properly. Now, this is actually something that John Barnett, the whistleblower, mentioned years ago as one of the issues that he found and tried to tell Boeing about and that Boeing didn't correct it. When the FAA, which is the regulatory <clears throat> agency, uh, looked into it, they did find, as well as Boeing did admit, that some of the oxygen uh, masks did not work properly. This was years ago. Now it's 2024. The door blows off. The oxygen masks are not functioning properly, which led to a lawsuit by several of the passengers on that plane who are currently suing Boeing for those oxygen masks not working. Passengers have already launched lawsuits as Boeing's CEO tries to blunt criticisms. We feel that safe airplanes, our people do. We have confidence in the safety of our airplanes. And that's what all of this is about. And we fully understand the gravity. On top of that, that door blowing off of Alaska Airlines resulted in another criminal investigation by the Department of Justice. There was one before, and we'll talk about that too. It's, it's a lot. So essentially, things were ramping up. Adding fuel to the fire is two things. First of all, this case was set to go on trial in June, which was about to get a lot of attention. And second of all, although there are a lot of whistleblowers, John Barnett is very different from all the other whistleblowers because he had receipts, okay? A lot of these other whistleblowers were sort of fired, let go, did not have access to documents, were sort of like walked out of the building. There's several group of managers screaming at me to dumb down my work instruction. Woods appealed to Boeing's Human Resources Department, claiming he was being harassed for doing his job. Weeks later, they fired him. He turned to the FAA, filing a whistleblower complaint. Boeing said, okay, we fixed it, and then they closed the investigation. I always tell people when they call me, they call me up with information and they say, well, I have all this information about this dangerous situation, should I blow the whistle? And I said, well, you know, not unless you have a private trust fund or another job to go to, because you'll have a, a, a problem earning a living. It shouldn't be this hard to do the right thing. Versus John Barnett, who was building a case, had documents on computers, had all kinds of things, and he retired and then he sued them. So they didn't really see it coming. And he had been there for over three decades. Let's talk about what was happening the day that John Barnett was found dead. According to his attorney, his name is, by the way, Turkowitz. That's how I'm going to refer to him. And I want to read you a quote from an interview that he had. Turkowitz was especially buzzed about this session because Barnett was slated to continue the account of the production gaffes he had allegedly witnessed up close on the Boeing factory floor. A dramer, dramer, I, sorry, a dramatic narrative that he had started the previous day. The previous day, Barnett had been on a roll as a video camera recorded the event. John testified for four hours in questioning by my co-counsel Brian, says Turkowitz. This was following seven hours of cross-examination by Boeing's lawyers on Thursday. He was really happy to be telling his side of the story, excited to be fielding our questions, doing a great job. It was explosive stuff. As I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, this is the best witness I've ever seen. At one point, says Turkowitz, the Boeing lawyer protested that Barnett was reciting the details of incidents from a decade ago and specific dates without looking at documents. As Turkowitz recalls the exchange, Barnett fired back. I know these documents inside out. I have had to live it. That Friday, Barnett's testimony ended at around 5 p.m., and the parties reconvened an hour later. John was really tired and didn't want to testify anymore that day, says Turkowitz. He wanted to drive home to Louisiana starting that evening as he had planned. He had told his mom that he'd be home on Sunday, and it took him two days to drive home. I suggested that we break for a week or two. But the Boeing lawyers took the position that no more depositions could be taken until Barnett completed his testimony. Turkowitz didn't think the judge would stand for the restriction. 
We had a March 30th deadline for completing the depositions. There was a list of 20 witnesses from both sides. On our list were around eight witnesses who had worked with John and backed his eyewitness version of events at the plant. We knew Boeing would file a motion for summary judgment, and we wanted to lay out through John's testimony that he was subjected to a hostile work environment. Boeing did not respond to a request for the story. Barnett basically was like, you know what, let's keep going. I want to get it over with like we're so close. So it says, quote, according to Turkowitz, he told the lawyers, let's just get it done. I've already been waiting for seven years. So then after this, John Barnett goes back to the Holiday Inn in Charleston because he lives in Louisiana and this case is taking place in Charleston. So he's staying at a hotel there. And remember, well, not remember, I didn't tell you yet, but Charleston is like where the factory is, where all these problems are that John Barnett is, you know, is whistleblowing about, if that's even how you say that. Now we are in the morning of March 9th, which is the day that John Barnett is found dead. So that morning there was a rainstorm, thunderstorm, it was like six inches of rain. John Barnett was supposed to go to finish his deposition his testimony, and he was late. He didn't show up. So at first, the attorney said that he wasn't surprised or worried because of the rain. So he was like, okay, you know, maybe he's just like delayed. After a while, he decides, you know, let me call him, see if he needs a ride. When he calls John's phone, it goes to voicemail. And so then he's like, I think I'm going to call the hotel and ask for like a wellness check. That's when the hotel calls the lawyer and they're like, listen, we checked his room. He's not there. Um, and that's when the lawyer says, check the parking lot. He has an orange Dodge Ram truck. So the hotel staff go out there and they do see the truck. When they go and approach the truck, they see a man who is sitting there and there's a pistol in his hand and he's not moving. So they call police. At this point, they don't really tell the lawyer anything. And they just are like, we had to call EMT. So the lawyer is like, oh my God, he thought that John Barnett had a heart attack. So not just John's lawyers, but even Boeing lawyers, they end up heading over to the hotel thinking that John Barnett had a heart attack. Well, when they get there, there's like police cars everywhere and they find out that actually John Barnett was shot. And I would like to read you from the police report. It says here that they are saying that the case is active, but the incident type, they're already saying that he like took his own life, but you know, still is under investigation. So I would like to read you the summary. It says here, on March 9th, 2024, at approximately 10, 17 hours, Officer Ward responded to 301 Savannah Highway, Holiday Inn, located in the city of Charleston in reference to a welfare check. Officer Ward arrived on scene and made contact with a hotel employee who advised that there was a male in a Clemson orange Dodge Ram pickup truck with a firearm in his hand. Sergeant Feeders, Officer Ward, and Officer Drayden cautiously approached the vehicle and attempted to make contact with the male party. It should be noted that there was no active stimulus in the vehicle. While visually clearing the vehicle, officers observed a white male in the driver's seat with what appeared to be a silver handgun in his right hand resting on his lap and his right pointer finger still remaining on the trigger. The male had what appeared to be a gunshot wound near his right temple and showed no signs of life. Lying in plain view on the passenger seat was a white piece of paper that closely resembled a note. CFD Tower 105 was requested to assist in opening the passenger side door by utilizing a Slim Jim device. Once access was gained into the vehicle, the aforementioned silver handgun was removed from the male's hand for safety reasons. Shortly after, Medic 3 pronounced the victim deceased at approximately 10.33 hours. It should be noted that a DMV search of the vehicle, Louisiana tag blank, yielded a registration returned to a John M. Barnett victim. Furthermore, Officer Ward spoke with a general manager who advised the following. On March 2nd, 2024, a guest by the name of John Barnett checked into room 511 with the expected departure date of 3-6-2024. 
On 3-6-2024, Barnett extended his stay to 3-8-2024 and was expected to check out that morning. Surveillance video of Barnett exiting the hotel on the morning of 3-8-2024 is available upon request. It should be noted that the address provided on the guest paperwork from blank was blank. Blank stated the hotel received a phone call from a Rob stating that he was a friend of Barnett's at approximately 10 o'clock hours requesting a welfare check on his co-worker John Barnett. Rob provided a description of the victim in his vehicle which led employees to the aforementioned Dodge Ram in the parking lot. Officer Ward spoke further with Blank who advised the following. Blank was advised by Blank to check the victim's room 511 before checking outside for his vehicle. Blank along with a few additional employees knocked on the victim's door but did not get a response. This led to the parking lot where he eventually found the victim in the vehicle. It should be noted that Blank stated he heard a pop sound near the vehicle at approximately 9.24 hours when he was working on the exterior of the hotel, but he did not think anything of it at the time. An SCDMV search of John Barnett yielded a return for a white male matching the description of the victim. Officer Warren ran the above name and date of birth provided by the C. SCDMV searched through the NCIC and discovered a John M. Barnett, Louisiana driver's license redacted, residing at the address previously provided by blank. Officer Ward was able to match the search results with the victim's driver's license that was found by CPD, sorry, CPD Central in his hotel room. The coroner confirmed the victim's identity was the same Louisiana driver's license. CPD General uh, Central, just, oh my God. CPD Central Sergeant Brown and Detective DeLucia crime scene and the coroner were all advised and responded to the scene, taking over the investigation. Officer Ward stood by and secured the crime scene. This incident was recorded on officers CPD issued BWC. So that was the police report that was released and immediately people started keying in on a few details. First, they talked about the fact that his finger was still on the trigger and that that is supposedly uncommon when you fire a gun, like it sort of doesn't stay in there. It depends on how deep into the trigger. So for example, you know, this is, I don't know, like here's the, you know, the, the outside part and here's the trigger where you pull, you know, there's that metal part, you know, how far in is it? If his hand was really far in like that and he pulled it, even the force of it may have kept his finger in. But if it was, let's say, on the tip like that and he pulled it, it could have it could have fallen out. You understand? That's one thing people are talking about. Then they brought experts in and they were saying that, um, you know, it's very rare that the gun just falls on your lap like that after such an impact, especially if you're, let's say, his right temple, right hand, right? They were saying, it, you know, it would, it would flop, flop. It wouldn't just gently, it, it's, people were saying it seemed staged is, is, is what I'm trying to say, based on the fact of the position of his hand and how his finger was still on the trigger. Again, speculation, we don't know. Additionally, there are some details like the fact that his driver's license was found in the hotel room and he was in the vehicle. Does that indicate that he was planning to take his own life? And so why would he need his driver's license? Does that indicate that, you know, he was taken out in a rush by someone else and didn't get in? I don't know. This is all speculation. Uh, additionally, something else people are mentioning is the surveillance camera issue of them saying they last saw him leaving on the morning of the 8th, according to that manager, saying there's this footage upon request but he was found on the 9th in the hotel room. The hotel staff who did interviews with media afterwards, they said that they saw him come back the evening of the 8th. He was eating a quesadilla, drinking Coke, scrolling on his phone in the hotel, was fine. And the morning that the hotel staff went to do the welfare check in John Barnett's room, they said there was a Taco Bell uh, soda with the ice melted, but there was still condensation there which indicates he would have maybe gotten Taco Bell for breakfast, came back, and left his driver's license, and then went out to the car and took his own life, in which case maybe there's footage of this, but at the time police didn't know based on the check-in, check-out information, because they didn't know at that time that he was extending and testifying and all that. You have to understand this was done that morning, so they don't really know. Maybe now 
information we don't have, they went and got that. So just because it's not mentioned here doesn't mean the police don't have it and it doesn't exist. Okay. When police came out and made the announcement after his death, they said, detectives are actively investigating this case and are awaiting the formal cause of death, along with any additional findings that might shed further light on the circumstances surrounding the death of Mr. Barnett. But the coroner said that John Barnett died from a, quote, self-inflicted wound and that they did not find any initial signs of foul play. There is a source that reported to media that the police dusted his car for fingerprints inside and out, which is, quote, unusual in a unaliving, self-unaliving case. But, you know, maybe they're being thorough. Maybe once they found out that he was a whistleblower and stuff, they're like, mm, let's check for prints. Apparently there's two detectives that are conducting this case and they're not asking for any additional help from outside sources, which people are a little bit like, um, can we trust them? It's such a high profile case. Boeing is very influential in the Charleston community because they're like, one of the biggest job creators and everybody like knows someone who works there or is connected. So people are like, can we even trust the police department? You know, conspiracy theory, blah, blah. So after this was all announced, John Barnett's friend, she came out and she did an interview where she basically said, John Barnett told me if something happens to me and they say, I took my own life, don't believe it. He wasn't concerned about safety because I asked him, I said, aren't you scared the way he which are, uh, no, I ain't scared. He said, but if anything happens to me, it's not suicide. Remember when I mentioned to you about how John was a different whistleblower and more of a threat, according to his own attorneys, and I'll read you the quote. It says, what was most unusual from his lawyer's perspective was that he had the receipts. Unlike would-be whistleblower clients who find themselves perp-walked out of the plant without access to their phones or email accounts, Turkowitz told the prospect John had meticulously documented everything. He had thousands of pages stored on his computer. Those documents were especially invaluable because of the meager force of the AR-21 statute governing aviation whistleblowers, which forces industry employers who are fired for speaking out about unsafe practices to litigate their grievances in a secret court system operated by the Department of Labor that lacks subpoena power. This is also what lawyers mention was the reason why initially John's case got dismissed, not because the judge didn't think the case was valid, but because they don't have subpoena power. But then John appealed it, asking for more of a chance to get those documents, got the documents, that then the judge said, okay, now we have a case. So they let the appeal move forward. Boeing attorneys tried to get that dismissed, and the judge did not get it dismissed. In fact, the judge said, you guys are not being forthcoming with documentation. Several months ago, this happened. It says, in orders last fall and winter, holding Boeing to deadlines to turn over evidence in the case, the judge suggested the company was foot dragging, saying its efforts to identify records of other retaliation complaints by workers at its Charleston plant, quote, are woefully lacking, end quote. And its claim that it had complied with earlier orders, quote, disingenuous at best, end quote. Remember I told you that door flew off of the uh, uh, American, not American, sorry, Alaskan Airlines uh, aircraft, the, the, the door flew off and there's this investigation going on and there was reports that the door was delivered with two bolts missing, which led to it falling off midair. Boeing said that it accidentally overwrote the security footage at the factory where the work was done on the Alaskan Airlines jet and that the crew who oversaw the work would, quote, not be able to provide a statement to NTSB or give investigators an interview owing to, quote, his medical issues. Now we need to go back in time to really understand how we get to March 9th, 2024, we need to go back to 1997 because this is when people believe everything started going to shit for Boeing. What started here was that there was this merger that happened. Boeing before this was the standard in safety, the gold standard uh, since the 60s and they just were safe and run by engineers and like ingenuity, like just amazing, revered, 
fabulous, amazing, whatever. Part of the reputation that Boeing had was based on the 737 aircraft, which came out in the 60s and is till this day, you know, one of their most popular and the safest aircraft and what they're known for. Okay. The 737, not the MAX. We'll get into that later. So in 1997, Boeing decides that it is going to merge with this company called McDonnell Douglas. Now this is a military aviation defense company. Now the thing is McDonnell Douglas was actually failing. It was not doing well. And there's this quote that goes around that says that McDonnell Douglas bought Boeing with Boeing's money. And why is that? Because what essentially happened was Clinton at the time, President Bill Clinton, was really for this merger. And, you know, some people say that Boeing was kind of like pressured to buy it for like $14 billion, but there was incentives for Boeing too, because they wanted to get into the military. They wanted their infrastructure and their contracts, whatever. The point is this company had been run to the ground by the CEO, whose name is Harry Stonecipher. He was not good at what he was doing because he ran the company into the ground. But oddly enough, when Boeing acquired and merged with this company, they put Harry as the CEO, okay, and he was given twice the amount of shares in the company than the Boeing CEO, Phil Condit, and then the, the management was all filled with McDonnell Douglas people, so these like military contracting people instead of the engineer people were now running the show, and they were given a lot of money, a lot of shares, and so that's why they say McDonnell Douglas bought Boeing with Boeing's money because it became their company essentially, but they used Boeing's money to get it and gave themselves more stuff. And according to uh, the former president of Boeing's commercial airplane group, his name is Ron Woodward, he said, quote, we thought that we'd kill McDonnell Douglas and we had it on the ropes. I still believe that Harry outsmarted Phil and his gang bought Boeing with Boeing's money. We were all just disgusted. More than that, he added, the company had, quote, paid way, way too much money for McDonnell Douglas, and we're still paying for it. We wrote off so many tens of billions of dollars for that whole mess. The reason why this is a turning point is because this is when they say the culture changed. Stan Sorcher. He was a physicist at Boeing for over 20 years and felt these changes firsthand. And he said he was so proud of cutting his mm, capital expenditure budgets by 60%. Capital expenditures for us were improvements in the factory, in the shop floor, in processes and materials and things like that. I thought, no. Harry ran McDonnell Douglas into the ground when he was in charge. So now that he's in charge of Boeing, well, he ran it into the ground too, because he's not good at what he does. He was spending money on the wrong things. It was sort of losing its competitive edge when it came to being the dominant aircraft manufacturer in the world because now there's this other company called Airbus. It's a European aircraft manufacturer and it is now becoming competitive with Boeing. Currently there's what's called a duopoly. So you know when something's a monopoly? Duopoly means there's basically two companies that dominate the entire industry. So like 90, over 90% 90 of aircraft that are commercial in the world right now are either Boeing or Airbus. So they essentially dominate the industry in a duopoly. Here's another thing that is very important to talk about, and that is the lobbying and the money that Boeing spends in the government of the United States instead of on creating better aircraft. Boeing spends a lot of money on politicians and on lobbyists, which are people that go to Washington paid by Boeing, and they basically influence through money or whatever other things politicians to make laws in their favor, basically. The president's former chief of staff came from Boeing's board, as did his second commerce secretary. As Secretary of State Hillary Clinton helped broker a $3.7 billion sale of Boeing planes to a Russian airline. Even President Obama boasts that he works for Boeing. So I, I, I tease Jay every time I see him, I said, I, I, you know, I deserve a gold watch because I'm selling your stuff all the time. Boeing uh, paid no taxes in 2013, no federal income taxes. Something happened in 2005. In 2005, Boeing 
lobbied for this this new program to exist okay which is the organization designation authorization or it's known as ODA okay and the FAA which is the Federal Aviation Administration it's a government administration that is supposed to regulate the aircraft industry in America the regulators at the FAA will rarely cross Boeing they simply won't the did this program that really benefited Boeing. What it did was it allowed Boeing to self-regulate. So instead of the FAA making sure that Boeing was doing what it was supposed to do, Boeing was in charge of making sure that Boeing was doing what it's supposed to do. So how the hell did that happen? Well, turns out because the government employees aren't really paid that much and there's no incentive for like the biggest brightest people to work for the FAA all the big smart engineering aviation people they go work for private companies like Boeing and they get paid more so what ends up happening is that apparently the people who work at the FAA aren't smart enough to actually know how to regulate these very innovative engineering things that Boeing is doing. And there's literally text messages of Boeing employees making fun of FAA people when they're showing them a presentation that they don't understand what's going on, saying that they look like dogs watching TV. And let me tell you two really interesting statistics, okay? The FAA, at the time that these planes that crashed and killed over 300 people, at the time that that certification was done, 90% of that certification was done by Boeing for Boeing. It had been delegated by the FAA. And then that little 10% that the FAA was in charge of, we're going to see how they Jedi mind tricked them and did all these things to sort of lie and get their certification that they shouldn't have gotten. <coughs> Uh, the head of the FAA was asked about this, like, what, why are you delegating like all this stuff? And the head of the FAA said, if we wanted to like do it ourselves, we would have to hire 10,000 more employees who would cost the U S taxpayers 1.8 billion with a B dollars per year. So there's this woman, her name is Mary Chiavo, and she was a former inspector general at the United States department of transportation. And she said, at the FAA, they know they're outgunned by Boeing. They know they don't have the kind of resources they need to do the job they're tasked with doing. They pretend to inspect, and Boeing pretends to be inspected, when in fact, Boeing is doing it all almost entirely by itself. Because Boeing knew whatever they did and whatever they submitted to the FAA, it was going to be certified, so they got sloppy or sloppier. In 2006, okay, a year after this delegation thing was created, Boeing actually gets fined, okay, $600 million for, quote, illegally hiring government officials and for improper use of proprietary information. Also in 2006, Boeing was cutting costs by outsourcing the manufacturing of parts that were historically made in Boeing, by Boeing, to overseas um, manufacturers that were cheaper. And they were basically getting these cheaply made parts from around the world, putting it together and putting the Boeing logo on it. Whereas before that was all done in-house to their high standards that made them who they are known for being, not anymore. So at this time now, Boeing is developing a new airplane called the 787 Dreamliner. It's like supposed to be revolutionary, but in fact, it was a lie. It was known as the big lie because on July 8th, 2007, 787, uh, Boeing had this huge unveiling thing. It was like televised and Ted Turner was hosting it and had all the media there. Watching us live around the world broadcasting, I'm told in 45 countries in nine languages for the premiere of this very exciting new Boeing 787 Dreamliner. The Dreamliner is the plane of the future. And they were like unveiling this amazing new airplane and it wasn't even actually real. Like it was just the shell of the plane. We learned that the whole thing was a sham. What I realized walking around it is that you could, you know, look up in the wheel well and you could see daylight. Beautiful, isn't it? Absolutely beautiful. 
while they're showing them the shell, they're like, in two months, the whole plane is going to be ready. Well, two months come and go and the plane ain't ready. So they're like, mm, um, there's going to be a bit of a delay. And then a couple months, mm, delay, mm, delay. And there's calls of Boeing talking to its investors, trying to like, be like, hey, sorry, we're late. It's not a failure how the airplane goes together. It's just a really complicated puzzle. We wish we didn't have to do this. Uh, new kinds of innovation present challenges and uh, we're doing our best to meet them. We know that we can and must do better. You have to understand this was unprecedented. There'd never been a Boeing delay in a Boeing program. This is when you started to have this push from management to rush, 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 and say, fuck you, quality. What they actually did was they were shortening the time that employees had to complete tasks. They were adding more work while shortening the time. Oh, and then they cut their pensions too, right? And so at this time, there is a manufacturing plant in Everett, Washington, because Boeing was like created in Washington. For generations, it's been in Washington. There is a community of workers that have worked for generations in the aviation industry. There's a strong culture. If someone's into aviation and they wanna like make commercial aircraft, like it's like the place to go. So these workers, they end up going on strike because they're part of a union. The strike cost Boeing billions and added to the Dreamliner's delays. Boeing's stock was in free fall. And now the higher ups are pissed. They are like super pissed. So they decide, okay, you know what? We don't need you guys. Like we're, we're gonna keep you if we need you, but like we're gonna act like we don't need you, you're replaceable. They decide they're gonna open another assembly line somewhere else and they really don't want a union there, okay? They don't want strikes. They want cheap, cheap, cheapity cheap, and that's what they got because they end up going to Charleston, South Carolina. They gave them, um, how much was it? A billion dollars in tax breaks. South Carolina also gave them $33 million to train the locals there because the workers in the area uh, were not skilled like the ones in Everett, Washington. So here's the thing. First of all, South Carolina has the lowest percentage of union workers in the nation. But also, they don't have that aviation history of generations of people and working like there is in Washington. So they were actually taking people who were, quote, flipping burgers and training them on the job to build this aircraft, these aircrafts. They hired these people off the street, working, flipping burgers for making sandwiches on subway. So you've got an unskilled workforce, but you know what? Maybe they're unskilled, but they're very affordable labor. They don't have a union over there and they're getting all these tax breaks. So Boeing is like, whatever. Well, it turns out they couldn't, like they, they actually couldn't do it. So they end up having to bring people from uh, nearby states to get them to work at this uh, Charleston plant. Also, they're now realizing they need to get some of these quality workers from Washington down to um, South Carolina to train these workers, but they're like, don't bring in the union people. Like we got it, we don't want the union ones. So needless to say, right, this is a shit show, okay? And it's only gonna get worse. And this is where John Barnett, the dead whistleblower, he comes into play. So John Barnett, he worked with them for decades. And now it's 2011, and at this point he is now a senior quality control manager. They take him from Washington and they send him to go to Charleston to oversee what's going on and make the plant better, right? They needed his help. The problem is they wouldn't actually let him do what they hired him to do. So you've got the 787 Dreamliner that they are delayed and trying to rush and make. And then now something else happens in 2010. Airbus. Remember that other company I told you about, the European aircraft manufacturer? Yeah. They come out and they say, we are announcing a new plane. We're calling it the A320neo or Neo for short. A Neo, new version of their most popular 
very much used by a lot of people in the industry, which is the A320, but it's more fuel efficient. It's got bigger engines, it's saving money on gas, and because it is so similar to the one that's already super popular, it doesn't require additional pilot training. For airline companies, this is amazing. They're like, we don't have to pay for training because that's expensive, and it's going to save us more fuel. So yeah, we want it. We want to buy it. Now the gag is, the gag is, just days before Airbus announced this, Boeing publicly said they were planning on creating a whole new plane instead of redesigning their most popular plane, which is the 737. So keep in mind, at this time in the airline industry, the two most popular planes are the Boeing 737 and the Airbus A320. Well, when this announcement came out, Boeing was like, it's fine. Like they're, they're misguided. They don't understand. That's going to be harder to do than they think. Like, we're fine. We're still going to make a whole new plane. But then a year later in 2011, the CEO of American Airlines calls the CEO of Boeing. And this is a very infamous call where it changed everything because American Airlines had for decades only flown Boeing aircraft. And now they called Boeing to be like, listen, we want the Neo. Like, we're going to order the Neo. This is a courtesy call. And so the CEO of Boeing basically was like, no, no, no. We promise we're going to make something to compete with that. And then he goes back to the board of directors and he's like, oh my God, we're going to lose our client. They're buying the Neo. Like, what do we do? And they decide they're going to exactly copy Airbus and they're going to redesign the 737 to make it more fuel efficient without requiring additional pilot training, which is very, very important to why the planes crashed and people died. And that is what will become known as the 737 MAX, which nowadays with all these crashes, people are saying, don't fly the MAX, don't fly the, the MAX is the worst. This is the story of how the MAX became what it is today and what led to people's death. Are you ready? You need to get ready because it's depressing. Okay, sorry, 2011. They are still trying to get this 787 Dreamliner out. And guess what? October 2011, they are able to get the 787 Dreamliner to fly commercially. John Barnett now is seeing really fucked up shit happening with the Dreamliner at the Charleston, South Carolina plant. He is noticing things like sharp pieces of metal debris that are left inside the plane next to wiring, electrical wiring, that if that sharp metal moved and cut into the wiring could create a catastrophic event. So he tells management about this issue and management's like, mm, we're not going to do anything about it. No biggie. FA look into it and they find out that there are metal shards actually there and they actually block Boeing from delivering Dreamliners until they fix this shard issue. So they do and the Dreamliner is, is back out again making deliveries. But now the higher ups are like, this Barnett dude is a fucking problem. And all hell is about to break loose. In 2013, two years after the first Dreamliner starts flying commercially, there's a problem. A brand new Boeing 787 Dreamliner makes an emergency landing. It's just the latest in a string of embarrassments for Boeing's state-of-the-art aircraft. So January 16, 2013, all Nippon Airways makes an emergency landing after a battery catches on fire. And this is the second incident of a battery catching on fire on the Dreamliner in two weeks. Come to find out, remember how I told you they were outsourcing the manufacturing of these parts instead of making them in Boeing? Well, they were like using this really volatile kind of battery and the plant that was making the charges for the battery was like saying that it was really too volatile to the point where their factory burnt down because it exploded from this Boeing battery. But Boeing is like, we're, we're going to put it in the plane, put it in the plane. Uh, because of this, the Dreamliners were grounded. No Boeing fleet had ever been forced from service. The dream was over. Now, okay, they're fucking pissed. They're just like, okay, 
We're already dealing with this goddamn delay. We finally got the shit out. And then Barnett's over here telling the FAA about the shards. We got that cleared. Now this damn battery's on fire and now we're grounded. Meanwhile, we're still trying to make these max uh, planes that we weren't planning on making, but we're scrambling. So they're just like, they're fucked, okay? That's really what's happening. And, and how they're dealing with it is to just put pressure on the workers, cut corners, and just obsessively worry about the investors and the shareholders and not give a shit about safety and quality. There is one thing they did that's going to help them, and that is all the money they spend in Washington and how they basically are, you know, the FAA is kind of Boeing's bitch, okay? I'm sorry to say it like that, but that's just the way it is, in my opinion. So there's this guy. His name is Ali Bahrami, and huh, this guy, okay, what a dick. Ali Bahrami. He was the FAA's man in charge of the Dreamliner. And thanks also, and recognition for Ali Bahrami. It was Bahrami who signed off on the Dreamliner batteries, and after two failed and the FAA grounded the Dreamliner, it was Bahrami who signed it back into the air. And he was supposed to be regulating for the FAA, for the safety of Americans, but really he was doing things to benefit Boeing. And after he left the FAA, he became a lobbyist for Boeing in Washington. One of the first things he did was to appear before Congress to call for greater self-regulation. We urge the FAA to allow greater use of delegation to increase the collaboration that improves aviation safety. There's not a weird thing with that at all. Mm. Next, April 23rd, 2013, Dreamliners are back in the air flying, even though they did not actually know the root cause of the fire. Boeing was like, we put a box around it and like, it's good now. Any fire will be impossible because there's not enough oxygen to support combustion. Remember John Barnett? Yeah, he keeps coming back. Okay, John Barnett is still inspecting these Dreamliners and he's noticing other things now. He is saying that he is noticing the oxygen uh, masks that fall down, 25% of them roughly don't work. He tells management about it. They don't do anything. Again, he goes over their head to the FAA. Turns out it's true, they don't work. And FAA is like, it's okay, They're gonna, Boeing's gonna fix it. So like, we'll just, we're not gonna take it out of service. As we know, as recently as 2024, January, when Alaska Airlines, when the door flew off the plane in the middle of the air, the uh, oxygen masks, not all of them worked, which is what the lawsuit that's currently happening against them, one of many, uh, is about. So John was trying to talk about this back in like 2016, okay? But again, nothing happened. This is another issue that happened. He would put things in writing because he's starting to see a pattern now where I mean, I'm telling you guys, nothing's happening. Like, people can die. I, I need to put this on the record. So he actually got reprimanded at a performance review for putting something that didn't meet like the quality standards in writing when according to his supervisor, he should have done it F to F, meaning face to face. And he told uh, John Barnett, you need to start like working in the gray areas, okay? The gray areas where it's like not safe essentially. Then there was this other thing that happened and this for John Barnett was a huge deal because there are parts that are defective airplane parts, and they are put in a scrap bin when they're just too defective to use. They're below the standard that Boeing would traditionally adhere to. So some of them have this, this red thing on them, lets you know that this is trash, scrap bin. And John Barnett says that a senior manager took a piece for a hydraulic tube, a dented hydraulic tube, from the scrap bin and installed it into a Dreamliner. And when John confronted him about it, the manager told him, don't worry about it. So again, John tries to tell the higher ups about this. And at this point they're like, listen, dude, you are a problem. And we don't want you to be a bigger problem. Like we're not trying to fire you and get another lawsuit because that's been happening with other people. So you know what? We're just gonna like relegate him to this like corner away from all the other quality control people, just like like they put him in a timeout, essentially. And the irony, the disrespect of it, was they had him where the defective scrap bin parts were. 
Like he just, they put him there. So he said, he's over there. He's demoralized. He's like, no one would talk to him. He said, quote, they isolated me from the other quality managers. I was basically by myself. They were constantly denigrating me. I could do nothing right. My complaints seemed, complaints seemed to go into a black hole. Then he said, while he's in that freaking spot, he's having to guard the damn scrap bin because employees are coming in there trying to take them to put them on planes. Another uh, employee, it's a quality manager, her name is Cynthia Kitchens, said that she was publicly humiliated, yelled at on the factory floor in front of hundreds of employees for flagging defective parts and that she was berated and humiliated and they would then dock her in performance reviews for flagging defective items, which is literally what her job is supposed to be, to do. That was weird. And so she ended up leaving Boeing. She sued them, but the case got dismissed, which is another thing when we talk about what made John Barnett different is in a lot of these situations, right? These people got um, their cases all dismissed. John Barnett did too, but he came back and he kept trying and now it was going to go to trial. It was very rare, if never at all, did anything ever go to trial when these people, whistleblowers, went up against Boeing. But Barnett, was very public, made it farther than anyone else, and had more evidence than anyone else. Okay, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying. And then in 2014, we have this expose that happens. It's Al Jazeera News. They have a factory worker go into the factory in Charleston, South Carolina, with like a hidden camera, talking to the workers, and the things they say were shocking. I know they don't. Do they? You know for a fact. Here, everybody is being pushed to make this regardless. Would you fly on one? You won't fly on one. Would you fly on one of these planes? Would you fly on one of these motherfuckers? Did you fly one of these? Yeah, it's sketchy. I probably would, but I mean, I'm having a death wish, dude. <laughs> I wouldn't fly on one of these planes. You wouldn't? Why wouldn't you? Because I see the quality going down around here. You're not building them to fly, we're building them to sell, you know what I'm saying? The interviewer then sets up a meeting with, I think it was the vice president of Boeing or higher up at Boeing, and confronts him with these documents and what the employees are saying. There's a couple of documents I want to show you here. I'm not familiar with the, the document. And then the like communications guy like comes in and cuts it short and was like, this is outrageous. Can you turn the camera off for a second? We have not had a chance to review this or craft a proper response. Barry, would you like to step back for a second? Okay. It was like not a good look for Boeing, okay? This is 2014. We're already having shit like this come out. Instead of Boeing responding by building better planes and spending money and, and keeping up with quality, instead, in order to artificially have their value better in the stock market, because it was taking a hit from all this bad publicity, they bought back their own stock. Buying back shares and paying huge dividends while you're laying off senior engineers to hire cheap labor in India, that's a sickness. They spent 60 billion with a B buying back their own stocks, stocks, stocks to artificially, I can't talk, I'm getting so worked up, to artificially inflate its value in the stock market, which by the way, they spent twice the amount to develop the Dreamliner on buying back their own stock. If they would have just spent half of that money to the Dreamliner, they wouldn't have these problems that they have now. But they're dumb because it's that McDonnell Douglas dumb mentality that ran them into the ground. It's not engineering, it's accounting. Okay, you need both for business, but when you have a whole entire industry and business that's based on exceptional engineering, and then you run it by people who, who, who are not even good at making money. That's the gag. It's, it's not even that they're like so good at making money. They're shit at making money, and they're shit at engineering, and they're running supposedly the best company for 
for engineering in the world. And that's why you have over 300 people dead. Yes, you do. So you know how I keep saying over 300 people died, over 300 people died. Okay. Well, these are the plane crashes that happened in 2018 and 2019, less than a year apart. And it involves the 737 MAX. In order for Boeing to compete with the NEO, they had to have these really big fuel efficient engines. So they end up getting the same engines that Airbus was using. Problem is the 737 had less clearance than the Airbus. So these engines, when they were placed where they usually would be, they were too low to the ground. So they had to move them farther up. When they moved the engines to another place in the plane, it solved that problem, but it created another. It would now cause the plane to sort of tilt up like this at lower altitudes, which would then make the plane stall. So they knew that the, the true fix would be to sort of restructure the plane around these new engines. But what would that do? It would cost money and time, and they didn't want to do that. Also, remember, a big selling point to compete with the NEO was not to require additional pilot training. If they made a whole new plane, right, with new structure and shit, they couldn't claim that it was just a redesign of the 737, which is why they called it the 737 MAX. Because when you just say that a plane is a redesign, you don't even have to get a whole new certification from the FAA. You get like a amended type certification, which is quicker and easier to get. Also, you can then say it's just so similar to the 737, no additional pilot training is required. So they said, all right, we can't restructure the plane. It's tilting up. Let's fix it with software. And this is where you have MCAS. If you've been following this case, you would have heard about MCAS, MCAS. What is MCAS? It is the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System. It's basically a software. It would take over when the nose was too high and it would bring the nose down and supposedly fix the problem. Okay, but that's not what happened. This software wasn't even that good of a software. Okay. Apparently it was outsourced also to India where they paid the workers $9 an hour to create the software. Furthermore, this software, it relied on a sensor known as the AOA sensor. Here's another huge scandal that came out that I didn't even freaking know until I started looking into this. Okay. Apparently the system relied on only one sensor, which they call in that aircraft world, like the industry, a single point of failure, which is like a no-no because it's supposed to have something called redundancy, which is not me when I'm talking all the time, but redundancy is basically when something is known to like fail or could fail, you make several of them and you put them on the plane because it's not like you can pull over on the side of the road and fix something. Just for reference, the NEO that they're competing with, it had three AOA sensors that were on the plane. The MAX, it had two sensors, but the MCAS software only got its information from one sensor, which is supposedly in the industry insane. It should have been getting it from both. Additionally, this sensor is known for giving faulty information, which is why the NEO, the Airbus NEO, put three on theirs, because they knew that it had a tendency not to work. Boeing decides to only put two and only get information from one, knowing that it has a tendency to give bad information which is what happened in the plane crashes. So now that I've given you that whole thing, we need to talk again about another thing, which is the fact that Boeing kept MCAS a secret from pilots. Pilots did not even know the shit that killed them could have even existed to kill them. But it was like literally a conspiracy to hide the fact that this existed. Not even like a tinfoil shit, like a literally they, there's evidence that they were trying to hide MCAS. The most disturbing thing we've found is there was a 2013 meeting and they conspired uh, to conceal uh, the system. This is what would happen. You're flying. There's one sensor that's speaking to MCAS and it's known for giving faulty info. So now it starts giving faulty info. What happens? The MCAS activates, meaning now it's taking over and it's pushing the nose down. Now if if, if it's falsely activated and the nose wasn't up, 
okay? And it was like this, and now the system f started pushing it down erroneously. What the fuck are you going to do? Your plane is nose diving. Well, usually in the, all other 737s, if you pull the yoke, like the, the steering, it would override the electrical thing and it would now make it manual. But guess what? Guess what? That didn't work anymore. This new software, this new design made it so that when they pull back, it was such an insane amount of force, they couldn't actually do it. They would have to like flip these switches within four seconds and then pull it. But even then it would reactivate over and over and over again. And each time it would make the, the, the yoke heavier, which wouldn't even allow them to pull back. Meanwhile, each activation is making it nosedive more and more until it sinks and crashes. And all this shit I just told you, pilots had no idea it existed because they didn't want to require additional flight, flight training, pilot training. Okay. So that's just the MCAS in a nutshell from an idiot who's trying to figure out what the fuck happened. There's also evidence that airlines would find out about little differences like this and try to ask for more training and Boeing employees would push back on that. And one even bragged that he made the airline feel stupid for requiring more training and that he Jedi mind tricked them and that he's making so much money for these people with his Jedi mind tricking. So I want to go over now the emails and the text messages that are really, really fucked up. 2014, they say, I would, an employee says, I would think that the NNC should provide some guidance to the pilots. In response, this guy, he responds and he says, this doesn't help our strategy with level B. And level B refers to like the pilot training. It says here, um, we need to sell this as a very intuitive basic pilot skill that the alert is just drawing your attention to the mistrim condition. That is our only chance of level B. And then the other employee responds. He says, thanks. I fear that skill is not very intuitive anymore with younger pilots and those who have become too reliant on automation. And this guy responds. He says, probably true but it's the box we're painted into with the level B training requirements. And then he says here, a bad excuse, but what I'm being pressured to comply with. Also, by the way, in 2014, there was a senior Boeing engineer. His name is Curtis Eubank and a chief test pilot by the name of Ray Craig, who wanted to create a backup system in case the MCAS malfunctioned. As I mentioned to you, it had a tendency to do so, to erroneously activate, and they wanted a backup plan, and they wanted to create it. But the executives at Boeing, they did not implement this because they said it would, what? Say it with me, require additional pilot training, and they don't want that so that they can compete with the Neo. Okay. Are they competing with the Neo now? The dumb motherfuckers. Anyway. So, um, dude, my voice, I sound insane. Um, what else is new? The engineer, uh, Curtis Eubank, he actually filed a complaint about this. Probably went nowhere. There was, um, another email. Okay. So this is December 17, 2015. And the engineer says, are we vulnerable to single AOA sensor failures with the MCAS implementation, or is there some checking that occurs? And uh, he was ignored by Boeing. In 2015, a day after this email, ironically enough, on December 18th, Boeing entered into an agreement, an FAA settlement where they were going to, through this settlement, resolve 13 investigations, which included, quote, failures of correct, corrective sorry, action. They also had Boeing pay multi-million dollar fines. And as part of this settlement agreement, they said that senior executive level management had to be involved with issues of safety and regulatory compliance. The reason why I'm mentioning this is to say that they, Boeing executives did or should have known per this agreement, all of this information that I'm telling you, these emails and these problems that were said they were legally required to know. So either they knew and they did nothing or they were not complying with the agreement. It's like you're on probation and you're violating probation essentially. 
criminals. So now let's talk something awful, fucked up, crazy, and oh my God. There's this other text message where someone says, honesty is the only way in this job. Integrity, when lives are on the line on the aircraft and in training programs, shouldn't be taken with a pinch of salt. Would you put your family on a Max Simulator trained aircraft? I wouldn't. The other employee says, no. So let's continue with the scandalous emails. Okay, so this is um, Mark Forkner, former chief technical pilot for the 737 MAX program, emailing the MCAS, emailing the MCAS, emailing the FAA, asking them to remove all mention of MCAS from the FCOM, which is the flight manual that pilots use. Hi, I confirmed with the flight controls engineers that MCAS does live in both FCCs and only needs one to function. So given that, are you okay with us removing all reference to MCAS from the FCOM and the training as we discussed, as it's completely transparent to the flight crew and only operates, operates way outside of the normal operating envelope. Thanks and see you tomorrow. This same guy actually bragged in an email about Jedi mind tricking um, regulators. So he's like, hi there. This is a subject of the email. He says, things are calming down a bit for my airplane cert, at least for now. I'm doing a bunch of traveling through the next few months. Simulator validations, Jedi mind tricking regulators into accepting the training that I got accepted by FAA, etc. And then there is this text exchange that became very famous between the same guy, Mark Forkner. He was the liaison between the FAA and, you know, the uh, Boeing. And, and so he was really responsible for a lot of this covering up that needed to be done. He has this conversation with another pilot, uh, Patrick Gustafson, where they basically talk about uh, how egregious uh, the MCAS is, and I'll read you this text exchange. We saw a lot of it online, but there's actually more. I want you to see, like, I'm going to show you all of it and then, you know, read you parts of it. But it starts um, here, and, you know, they're like, log off, log off, blah, blah, blah. They're talking about, like, how insane the job is and chaotic, and he says... Oh, shocker alert. MCAS is now active down to M2, which I think is Mach 2. It's running rampant in the sim on me, which the simulator, like the flight simulator. At least that's what Vince thinks is happening. And then Patrick says, oh, great. That means we have to update the speed trim description in volume two. They did not do this, by the way. So Mark responds, so I basically lied to the regulators. And then he put in parentheses, unknowingly. And so Patrick says, it wasn't a lie. No one told us this was the case. And he responds, he says, I'm leveling off at like 4,000 feet, 230 knots, and the plane is trimming itself like crazy. I'm like, what? Patrick says, that's what I saw on the Sim 1, but on approach. And um, Mark says, granted, I suck at flying, but even this was egregious. And then here's another screen recording I took from a text thread where they're basically talking about um, this is a joke, this airplane is ridiculous, we're having issues every update we do, seems like they'll never get it right, fix one thing, break three others, and they're just saying this is ridiculous and that no one wants to fix anything, okay? Then there are some more texts that I'll show you through here. Again, like I said, you guys can pause as much as you want, but I'm just going to put in all of them here for you. And there's one where they're talking about how they'll be shocked. It's such a shit show. Totally. I'll be shocked if the FAA passes this turd. They're doing all this last minute shit. I really do need to be there to make sure they haven't screwed things up too badly. The person responds, you know they did. Then here's another message where they're talking about the culture of Boeing. And this person says, you know, the cult, this group has created a culture of good enough, which is an incredibly low bar. It doesn't cut it anymore. The cozy days with regulators are behind us. And they're saying that the people just want recognition, never accountability. It can't be how we do things at Boeing anymore. Out with the old, in with the new, I say. This person says, got your night vision goggles? You'll have to do qual, like quality, with the light switched off. Ha ha. 
this isn't a true statement. The campus has declined the newer loads. This guy says, yes, I still haven't been forgiven by God for the covering up I did last year. None of this changes my mind. Can't do it one more time. The pearly gates will be closed. And he says, I just received a shovel to start my journey to the hotter place. Other person says, I'll end up there either way. There is no way anyone involved in ILC does not end up there. Face pump. They're talking about hell. Okay. Hell is the hotter place. Here's another text exchange. Someone said, the fact that this call took this long proves where we are. Exactly what? And there goes the final nail to the coffin. Final, I have some spares. I think there'll be more. At this point, there are more nails than wood in the coffin. The person responds, get silencer, put on end of gun, place adjacent to table, temple, sorry, and pull trigger. The problems stop. At this point, how can they consider continuing? Face palm. Someone responds, and then he goes, face palm, face palm, face palm, face palm. I think that's interestingly making a joke about ending their life considering what happened. Here's another one. This person says, not sure I'll be returning in April given this. I'm not lying to the FAA. We'll leave that to people who have no integrity. I'm sorry, the person responds. That is not acceptable. Your integrity is a priority for winky face. And the other person responds, smiley face. More Jedi mind trick talk. Where they're saying, yep, they bought the toys and tried to fit some sort of training into it. Completely back ass words. It's sell, it's sell, it sucks selling shit. So someone responds, fortunately, I have all the skills of a used car salesman and I have the ability to use the Jedi mind trick. Then there's talk about people not caring because they're exhausted. Who cares when you're exhausted? I'm freaking delirious, dude. Between this FMC crap, the redacted issue and everything else I'm spent. I bet you need some time off. Uh, yeah, we all do. By we, meaning the 737 group. The rest of the slackers can pick up our work. More talk of Jedi mind tricking. I just Jedi mind trick these fools. I should be given a thousand dollars dollars every time I take one of these calls. I save the company a sick amount of money. More Jedi mind trick. Someone said, what do you convince them of? He says, to simply produce an email from me to the DGCA that states all airlines and regulators that accept only the max CBT to make them feel stupid about trying to require any additional training requirements. Then here's this email I'll let you read where they're basically talking about the lies and the just the managers and that the, the culture's crap. And they were like basically saying that there's all these unethical and deceitful things that are happening and that someone from the management team was making a joke being like, oh, we're under budget. We should hire a, a yacht and sail around Miami Harbor to celebrate and even ask blank to submit the request. So they're cutting costs on production and they're getting under budget and they're wanting to rent yachts around Miami with the extra money. Nice. Now let's get back to what happened leading up to the deadly plane crashes. 737 MAX gets certified in 2017. Okay, as we know at this time, over 90% of the certification work was done by Boeing itself. And in May of 2017, the 737 MAX is put into service. Also in 2017, John Barnett retires and files his whistleblower complaint lawsuit against Boeing. A year later, in 2018, there is another whistleblower. His name is Ed Pearson. People have known you to be a whistleblower of Boeing. You know, putting passengers at risk and flight crews at risk, um, you know, feel obligated to speak up. I will not step on a, on a MAX. In fact, it actually happened to me. I purposely scheduled myself away from flying a MAX. And I got on the plane last and I realized it was a MAX and I had to walk off the plane. You know, the FAA has been absolutely asleep at the wheel. CEO is out of touch. Ed Pearson, in 2018, he still hasn't blown the whistle. In 2018, he was the senior manager at the Renton Washington 737 facility for Boeing, and he was overseeing the production of the, the final assembly of the 737s. And this is the factory where the two airplanes that crashed killing over 300 people were manufactured in. And he was sounding alarms in 2018. Ed Pearson 
writes to the head of the 737 program. His name is Scott Campbell. And this is what he says. He says, my first concern is that our workforce is exhausted. Employees are fatigued from having to work at a very high pace for an extended period of time. This obviously causes stress on our employees and their families. Fatigued employees make mistakes. This is especially true when combined with the hazards of unfamiliar environments like working out of position, slips, trips, falls, lotto, etc., As a manager representative on the IAM Joint Program Site Safety Committee, I know fatigue is frequently listed as a causal factor in serious occupational hazards. It has also become the number one contributing factor to vehicle accidents. My second concern is schedule pressure combined with fatigue is creating a culture where employees are either deliberately or unconsciously circumventing established processes. These process breakdowns come in a variety of forms adversely impacting quality. For example, making a workmanship mistake, missing an inspection item, not properly completing paperwork, or failing to recognize a functional test failure. I fully appreciate the importance of doing our best to meet RO, paint windows, B1s and delivery schedules, but there is much, much higher risk that we cannot lose sight of. I'm talking about inadvertently embedding safety hazard into our airplanes. As a retired naval officer and former squadron commanding officer, I know how dangerous even the smallest of defects can be to the safety of an airplane. Frankly, right now, all my internal warning bells are going off. And for the first time in my life, I'm sorry to say, that I'm hesitant about putting my family on a Boeing airplane. Nobody responded, nothing happened when he sent that. So then, uh, about a month later, conditions got worse, and Ed Pearson decides to speak to the person he just sent that email to, right? Scott Campbell, um, he decides to speak to him in person, and he tells him, listen, when I was in the military, we would have shut down production for stuff like this. Like, we should probably shut down production. Like, this stuff needs to be fixed. Scott responds and says, quote, the military is not a profit-making organization. And so we're not going to shut down. And that was it. It is now August 13, 2018, 11 weeks before the first plane crash. And Boeing delivers the plane to Lion Air that will crash and kill over 100 people. October 29, 2018, and the Lion Air Flight JT610 crashes, killing all 189 passengers and crew instantly. This is what happened. First of all, the captain had more than 6,000 hours flight experience, and 5,176 of those hours were on Boeing's 737s, not the MAX, but remember Boeing said you didn't need any additional training. They didn't know this, but before the flight even took off, the one sensor, it was giving a reading that was wrong. But the problem is there was this alert known as the disagree light. Okay. Now this is going to turn into a whole thing as well, because this was a feature that it would tell you, hey, you know those two sensors that we have on here where only the MCAS is only reading from one? Well, when they don't agree, which means one is faulty, which means the MCAS could get faulty info, a light will come on called the disagree light. Disagree, AOA sensor disagree alert. And it will basically let you know that these sensors aren't working correctly. Now, granted, they didn't know the MCAS even existed. They wouldn't know that they would affect the MCAS, but if they knew that there was an issue, they wouldn't even fly. They sold this thing that would make the light work as an optional add-on that would cost more money instead of standard. Even the planes that did have it as an option, they were not operating. 80% of these lights were not working on the plane and Boeing knew it. So there's a third thing now, okay? It says here, two minutes into the flight and unbeknownst to the pilots, MCAS took over the plane. Relying on the single erroneous AOA sensor, MCAS believed the aircraft's nose was too high and activated, sensing a stall. MCAS moved the horizontal stabilizer for 10 seconds to lower the plane's nose. And there's audio of the alarms blaring and all that shit when MCAS gets activated. 
Says one pilot searched through his flight manual for almost nine minutes trying to find the source of the problem and a solution. That this effort was unfortunately in vain because of Boeing's decision to excise all mention of the MCAS system from the flight control manual. Satellite data showed that Lion Air flight JT610 rose and fell more than 20 times as MCAS repeatedly activated, driving the plane's nose down. Records show the other pilot praying aloud as he struggled to pull back the on the control column. An action that in prior Boeing 737s, but not the MAX, would have permanently disabled any automated flight control systems. As the MCAS repeatedly activated and the speed of the plane increased, the control column got heavier. The pilot was pulling back on the column with more than 100 pounds of sustained force, but it was not enough. Less than 12 minutes after takeoff, Line Air Flight 610 crashed into the Java Sea at 500 miles an hour, killing all 189 people. But guess what? And this is something I don't know if people know, but I just found out and it was like, oh my God, I didn't know that. Did you know that the day before on the same exact type of plane, the same shit happened, but they didn't crash? Let me tell you what happened. The day before a Lion Air flight took off and the MCAS activated and the nose was going down. The only difference was there were three pilots on the plane. One was an off-duty pilot who had, quote, hitched a ride and was in the cockpit. This pilot happened to be aware of the fact that they had to, like, flip these switches and do something different than what was in the manual. Here lies a little bit of an issue, right? Should the pilots have known this happened? How did that pilot know this happened? it started coming out with all these investigations and stuff that the MCAS was this new thing that was added to the max that wasn't in the manual. Sorry, I need to blow my nose. The CEO, Dennis Muhlenberg, speaks out for the first time after the crash to Fox Business News. And the bottom line here is the 737 MAX is safe. And uh, we've been very transparent on providing information. But well, there's, there are new system that wasn't disclosed to the pilots. No, there are new systems on the airplanes that are designed to take advantage of the capabilities of the airplane. The airplane is safe. Was that information available to the pilots? Did they know how to operate it? Should yeah. the nose be in a different position? Yeah, in fact, that's part of the training manual. It's an existing procedure. In response to this, pilots are pissed. And there's this meeting that takes place between American pilots from Southwest and American Airlines who have a lot of these maxes on their fleet with executives at Boeing. And this meeting was secretly recorded and, you know, clips of audio from that were leaked. These guys didn't even know that the damn system was on the airplane, nor did anybody else. We flat out deserve to know what is on our airplanes. I don't disagree. We're the last line of defense to be in that smoking hole, and we need the knowledge. I don't know that understanding this system would have changed the outcome of this. You know, a million miles here, you maybe fly this airplane, and maybe one's going to see this ever. So we try not to overload the crews with information that's unnecessary, so they actually know the information that we believe is important. We want to make sure we're fixing the right things. Yeah, I get that. That's that's an important thing. We'll make sure we're fixing the right things. We don't want to rush and do a crappy job fixing the right things. But we also don't want to fix the wrong things. According to someone who was at that meeting, his name is Dan Carey. He is the American Airlines Union president. He said that Boeing told the pilots, quote, this wouldn't have happened to you guys because American Airlines had operable AOA disagree lights on their aircraft. Remember I told you that light that would tell you when the two sensors weren't communicating the disagree light. Well, guess what? Guess what? Huh. Southwest Airlines puts out a statement about the disagree light and they say, quote, Upon delivery, prior to the Lion Air event, the AOA disagree lights were depicted to us by Boeing as operable on all MAX aircraft. After the Lion Air event, Boeing notified us that the AOA disagree lights were inoperable without the optional AOA indicators on the MAX aircraft. We know now that 
this guy at Boeing told the American Airlines pilot, this wouldn't have happened, you guys, because you have the light and it works. Okay, a month later in 2018, right, there's another incident, which is this emergency landing that a Max has to make. And remember the whistleblower I told you about, Ed Pearson? He's still not a whistleblower at this time. He's working there. He, he was found out about this freaking plane crashing from the factory that he's in that he tried to tell people about, and he's just torn up about this. He decides in early 2019 to write an email to the CEO of Boeing, Dennis Muhlenberg, and expressing concern, the same stuff, and he doesn't get a response. Instead, the general counsel, like the, the in-house attorney, lawyer of Boeing, who's supposedly a close advisor of the CEO, contacts Ed and calls Ed Pearson. Ed reiterates everything, and nothing comes of that. So now we are three weeks before there is going to be a second deadly crash of a max that came out of this facility that Ed Pearson is trying to warn higher ups about. Three weeks before the second crash, he goes above the CEO's head and he writes this email to the board of directors. And it says, candidly, there remains many serious unanswered questions. For these reasons, I ask the board of directors assistance in your corporate governance and oversight role to ensure a the details of these safety concerns as outlined in my february 17 2019 sorry february 7th 2019 email are discussed with the board of directors and does not stop at the ceo or general counsel levels b an independent assessment of the 737 program is conducted per the recommendation outlined in my january 22nd 2019 email to include taking appropriate follow-up actions as required, such as asking customers to conduct inspections of in-service airplanes and developing agreed upon criteria for stopping the production system in the future to mitigate risk. So he's saying we need to tell current air airlines that have planes right now like to inspect them. And then C, he's saying the results of items A and B are shared with the appropriate Lion Air Accident Investigation Authorities at Boeing, FAA, NTSB, and NTSC. D, Boeing confirms with me these actions have been taken. NLT, which is, I think, no later than April 15th, 2019. I fully realize Boeing is not obligated to take these actions or get back in touch with me. However, absent such a confirmation, I'll be left to assume these actions were not taken and will be forced to pursue another course of action. I believe these are reasonable expectations with a reasonable deadline. I have no interest in scaring the public or wasting anyone's time. I also don't want to wake up one morning and hear about another tragedy and have personal regrets. Of course, this is something no one wants to happen. For what it's worth, if requested, I would make myself available to the board to answer any questions or provide additional information. Three weeks after this, the Ethiopian Air Flight ET-302 crashed March 10, 2019, killing all 157 souls on board. When Ed Pearson saw this on the news in the morning, he said he screamed. He screamed so loud, his wife woke up and was freaking like, what's happening? It was like he couldn't believe it. So what happened is that one minute into the flight, MCAS activated and it started forcing the plane down, like the nose of the plane down. And the cockpit was blaring with the alarm saying, don't sink, don't sink, don't sink. Now, the Ethiopian airlines pilots knew about the MCAS system at this point. They knew that it wasn't just pulling back the yoke to be able to override it, that you had to like flip the switches and do the thing. And that's what they did. Okay. It says here that you could hear audio of the pilot saying to the other one, pitch up, pitch up. So it says they followed the procedures outlined by Boeing set following the Lion Air crash and as set forth in the operations manual. The pilots flipped 
two switches and disconnected the electric trim motor and then tried to regain control. However, having cut electric power to stop the MCAS from seizing control of the plane, the pilots had also eliminated their ability to use the electric switch to trim the stabilizer back into a neutral position. Instead, the pirates pirates? The pilots were now forced to crank the wheel by hand, a physical process requiring significant brute strength given the aerodynamic forces buffeting the stabilizer. Despite pulling the wheel with all of their might, the pilots could not get the stabilizer to budge. It said, when the pilots attempted to activate the electronic trim switches in order to pull the plane's nose up, so they were now with the electricity, they're able to pull it, MCAS then reactivates, which then takes control of the plane and forced it into a steep dive. So they're damned if they do, and they're damned if they don't. And so less than a minute later, it crashed at almost 700 miles an hour, and it killed all 157 people on board. Now that you have a second crash of a MAX, where you've got over 300 people dead in just five months, and the initial information of how it happened was very similar to what happened to Lion Air. Many countries immediately just grounded all 737 MAXs, except for the FAA. The FAA was the last to ground the MAX. And actually, um, when they did announce they were grounding the MAX, the CEO, Dennis, of Boeing, he actually called Trump, President Trump, who was president at the time, and said like, please, let's like, he tried to go over basically the FAA's head and say, don't ground them. But then Trump w decided to ground it anyway. And he came out, he made a statement. Any plane currently in the air will go to its destination and thereafter be grounded. Boeing is an incredible company and hopefully they'll very quickly come up with the answer. After that, Boeing came out and they said, we're going to do a software update to the MCAS system. And that's going to fix everything. Also like, uh, not our fault. Like we actually, the, also the pilots should have known as well this time too. And now though, the Department of Justice, they had already started a criminal investigation for the Lion Air crash. And now that this, there was a second crash, the, the investigation went into overdrive. And now who comes back into the picture is John Barnett, who is currently at this time in 2019, still in an ongoing lawsuit with Boeing. He starts doing interviews with the New York Times, with BBC, with Australia, with anybody, everybody. He's out there and he's saying, I tried to tell you. I tried to stop this. Now you've got a bunch of people coming out. It wasn't just John Barnett. It was other employees and Ed Pearson and all these people. Like they start coming out in 2019 and basically saying, we tried to tell the management and the executives that the quality was down, the safety was down, and they didn't listen, and here we are. Meanwhile, Boeing is denying everything, and they're putting pressure on the FAA to get the planes ungrounded, okay? They want the planes back flying, and they want them to approve this software update. It got so bad that there was this incident that happened in June of 2019 at the Paris Air Show where the head of the FAA, Daniel Elwell, and the CEO of Boeing, who was Dennis Muhlenberg at the time, they secretly meet in the side inside the back of a parked military airplane because they didn't want people to see them. They have this conversation where the head of the FAA tells Boeing CEO, stop talking about when the plane is going to be flying again. Stop publicly saying it's going to be ready in uh, April, in the summer, in the blah, blah, blah. Like, stop. And the Boeing CEO says, you're right, we're not going to push. But then, literally, days after this meeting, the CEO publicly says, we're still looking at getting approved by summer. Then, uh, a few months after this, all of a sudden, there are these like issues with uh, Boeing 737NG, which is the precursor to the max having cracks, okay, on the wings and shit. You've got um, Captain Sullenberger. This captain, he's like very skilled. You remember how they're trying to blame pilots and stuff? This is a very skilled who made that emergency landing in the Hudson River, remember? Well, he said that the MCAS was a, quote, 
death trap, quote, the MCAS design should never have been approved, not by Boeing and not by the FAA. It was a pernicious and deadly design. Around the time that Captain Sully says this, there is this leak of the text messages that I read you earlier, right? Those happened before, but now in the wake of these two crashes, they're released. And it is not good. The, the Congress is doing hearings, reading them, chastising them. 346 people are dead. What these chief pilots described as egregious, you're the CEO, the buck stops with you. Part of this is the FAA finds out then how they were talking about them, calling them dogs watching TV and that they're like basically Jedi mind tricking them and shit like that. So now the head of the FAA, he writes this open letter to Boeing uh, CEO, uh, Dennis Muhlenberg saying, dear Mr. Muhlenberg, last night I reviewed a concerning document that Boeing provided late yesterday to the Department of Transportation. I understand that Boeing discovered this document in its files months ago. I expect your explanation immediately regarding the content of this document and Boeing's delay in disclosing the document to its safety regulator. The thing about this freaking CEO, Dennis Muhlenberg, man, he doesn't stop. He's relentless and he's going to go too hard and it's going to get him fired because he just kept pushing the FAA, pressuring the FAA, like to approve the software, clear the uh, max to fly, clear the max to fly. I'm going to read you some quotes. It says, November 2019. Mullenberg called FAA Administrator Dickinson, quote, to ask whether he would consider allowing the company to begin delivering airplanes before they were cleared to fly. FAA Administrator Dixon responded that he, quote, would look into it but made no commitments. Then Boeing ended up issuing this statement saying called 737 Max Progress Report, where it basically said that based on this schedule, it's possible that the resumption of max deliveries to airline customers could begin in December. The FAA administrator was pissed and he's apparently told his colleagues he never agreed to the December timeline. And he said that, quote, he felt as though he was being manipulated by Muhlenberg. So it says, Boeing's November 11th public announcement was a bridge too far for the FAA. On December 12th, 2019, the FAA held a, quote, tense private meeting with Muhlenberg in Washington, D.C. The Seattle Times wrote that, quote, Dixon delivered an unusually blunt dressing down to Muhlenberg in person. During the meeting, quote, the head of the FAA, AA reprimanded Boeing's chief executive for putting pressure on the agency to move faster in approving the return of the company's 737 MAX and chastised Muhlenberg for suggesting the plane would be recertified in 2019. The FAA then sent a note to Congress that was public saying, Boeing continues to pursue a return to service schedule that is not realistic due to delays that have accumulated for a variety of reasons. More concerning, the administrator wants to directly address the perception that some of Boeing's statements have been designed to force the FAA into taking quicker action. Boeing then comes out and is like, okay, we're not going to produce the MAX until January 2020. And then a week later, the CEO of Boeing got fired. And David Calhoun became the CEO of Boeing, January 13, 2020. During this time, okay, something happened. It's called the pandemic. Remember that? The MAX was still grounded and now nobody was really flying anymore. And so Boeing was losing money like crazy. At the end of 2020, they get a bone thrown. And that is they get cleared to fly the MAX again. The Department of Justice, uh, in 2021, they conclude their investigation, the criminal one, mm -hmm. and they found that Boeing conspired to defraud the FAA and that they attempted to cover up their failures. They said this is a criminal offense carrying the charge of conspiracy to defraud the United States. But they entered into an agreement with Boeing, and this was what the agreement was. Boeing was criminally charged. They had to pay $2.5 billion, and they also had to um, comply with certain conditions, and if they did, the charge, the criminal charge would be dropped in three years. This was in 2021. It's now 2024. Now we're coming up to close to when John Barnett is about to be found dead, January 2024. 
when the airplane door flies off midair on the Alaska Airlines flight. This was a big deal. Guess who comes out and starts talking again? John Barnett, still going in a lawsuit with them. He does his last ever interview was with TMZ. The FAA is saying that the plane is now safe to fly. What do you say? One, this is not a 737 problem. It's a Boeing problem. So once the airplane door blew off, the FAA grounded the plane, but not actually for long. Recently, up until like a couple days ago, there have been so many incidents with Boeing aircraft. I just want to go through some of them with you, okay? A week after this door flew off, there was an emergency landing in Japan on a Boeing airplane because there was a crack in the cockpit window. Then in a Boeing 787, a passenger from the UK was alarmed when they noticed pieces of tape on the exterior as they were flying to India. On March 4th, a Boeing 737 departed from um, the airport and it had to turn around and make an emergency landing. And then there was a Boeing 777 that was leaving San Francisco for Japan and it had to make an emergency landing in LA because the plane lost a tire during takeoff, which ended up smashing a car in the employee parking lot. Another 737 MAX in March 8th, it veered off the runway and like went into the grass when it was landing. So all this shit was going on, right? And one of the things that kept coming up was not just the door missing, but the oxygen mask issue, because it says here that a week later, a group of passengers that were on the um, Alaska flight, it says they launched a civil lawsuit in the United States against the airline and Boeing, alleging that several of the oxygen masks didn't deploy, and some people had to move around the plane to find a mask that could provide emergency oxygen so they could breathe. In response to this, John Barnett, the whistleblower, said, when I heard that some of the passengers on the 737 MAX 9 were saying that their oxygen mask won't work, it's like, well, we've known about that since 2016 and they've done nothing about it. In my opinion, Boeing needs a reckoning from the top down because like I say, this culture has been eating at it and eating at it and eating at it for 20 years. Now we're back to the beginning of March and John Barnett is about to be found dead. As I mentioned earlier, he was giving testimony. He had gone through the testimony with Boeing. He was giving this bombshell testimony through his attorneys on cross, where he was relaying all of the awful things that Boeing did with receipts. He had one day left. He was willing to push through. He was tired. He was tired. But he said, you know what? Let's do it. Let's get it done. And then... The trial was coming up in June. According to his attorneys, he was in a good mood the evening before, looking forward to testifying on Saturday. They said, quote, he was in very good spirits, really looking forward to putting this phase of his life behind him and moving on. We didn't see any indication he would take his own life. No one can believe it. We are all devastated. We need more information about what happened to John. The Charleston police need to investigate this fully and accurately and tell the public what they find out. No detail can be left unturned. And they said that they're planning on substituting John's estate and his family for John in order to keep the lawsuit going. And they will continue. And they are planning to still go to trial in June. And I'm sure the world will be watching. Two days after Barnett's death, okay, the New York Times reported that the FAA had done an audit on Boeing and found, quote, unacceptable quality control issues, that Boeing failed 33 out of 89 product audits, that there were 97 counts of alleged non-compliance, including mechanics at one of its key suppliers using a hotel key card and dish soap as makeshift tools to test compliance. Uh, NTSB that's conducting an investigation about what happened at Alaska Airlines asked for the surveillance footage. Remember Boeing said they accidentally overwrote the, overwrote the security footage and that the crew manager could not provide a statement or give an interview because of his medical issues. He's dead. I hope not. Anyway, so then John Barnett's family, they came out and they are holding their tongue, okay? They're not wanting to say he fully 100% took his own life and they're definitely not trying to say he was murdered 
they're like, we're going to wait for the investigation to be done. But in their opinion, they do feel like Boeing killed him, even if he took his own life, because of what they did to him, how miserable they made his life. So this is what his older brother said in a statement. He said about John, he was looking forward to having his day in court and hoping it would force Boeing to change its culture. He was suffering from PTSD and anxiety attacks as a result of being subjected to a hostile work environment at Boeing, which we believe led to his death. Since John's death, there have been more incidences, incidents, sorry. There was a Boeing uh, aircraft that had a freaking hydraulic leak and had to turn around. There was another Boeing 787 Dreamliner where 50 people were injured because a technical issue caused it to suddenly plunge midair, which threw people out of their seats, smashing them into the cabin ceiling. And there was another 737 that took off from San Francisco, had to make a landing in Oregon because an external panel was missing. So that's that. Let's now talk about the theories, okay? Because there are basically three main theories. You've got the official story theory, which is he took his own life. And then you have the conspiracy theory, which is that he was killed. And then there's like a third theory that is part of the he took his own life theory, which is not out of despair of like, he couldn't take it anymore, the mental illness, whatever, but maybe more like a, like a strategic thing he did to be like, this is going to get people talking. Now this will get more of an effect than any lawsuit could get. And it was like, he sacrificed himself for the cause. That's a theory that I've heard. And so I want to talk first about the official theory. If he, he himself said he had anxiety and PTSD and was really struggling. He was forced to retire 10 years early. He didn't want to retire. He was forced to retire. This legal battle had been going on for seven years. That particular day, he was, well, the day before he was tired, he just wanted to go home. He was having to drive to Louisiana instead of fly because he refused to fly. Maybe he was just over it. Maybe he just something, I don't know, something happened that night in that short span of time overnight that made him decide or maybe something that morning that he's like you know what I'm done so he he got his Taco Bell and he left it in the room and he didn't take his driver's license instead he went to the car with his pistol took a note either wrote it in the car or in the room locked the door and shot himself what did the note say we don't know now if it was a strategic thing all those same things I mentioned would be true, except it was, like I said, maybe he was a bit despair. Maybe he felt the lawsuit or the trial wouldn't actually achieve the change that he thought this action might do. Truth be told, I've been aware of the Boeing thing, but I didn't start looking into it like this and making a video like this about it until he was found dead. And that's a damn shame. Why didn't I talk about it before? So there is something to be said for this getting the attention that he wouldn't have got otherwise. I mean, I'm an example of that, which is kind of, I feel bad about that. Because like, why does it have to get to that point? And then you have the third theory, which is that he killed, someone killed him. So I want to read you this thing I found. I just thought it was interesting, and then we'll talk a bit more. So there's this person, his name is Steve Chancellor. He has written books on staged crime scenes because... In this case, if you think it is a murder, then it was staged to look like a suicide. So he said that when someone dies by suicide, the gun only remains in the person's hand 25% of the time. He said the mere fact that the gun was in the hand, I would pay attention to that. Because many times when someone is trying to make it look like suicide, they make that mistake and they put the gun in the hand. Which brings us to the things we talked about in the beginning of the video of his finger still being on the trigger, how likely is that, the position of his hand, how it was in his lap, um, his head was up, there was a bullet wound here, his finger was still on the trigger, and his hand was in his lap. You know, how likely is that? What about the note? Were there fingerprints on the car? If someone did it to him, before we speculate who, let's speculate how. First, it would have been someone either was in the car with him and shot him and then put it in there. So then there might be some surveillance footage if they have of the parking lot of that happening. 
they somehow coaxed him out of the room without the driver's license, and w- but with his keys. But he was supposed to go somewhere that morning, and he was late. So wouldn't he have had his driver's license with him and already be heading out? Or did they get him out there? The person who said they heard some loud noise at 9.54 but thought it was just the thunder and the rain, does that mean that that's when the shooting occurred? Is there surveillance footage showing John Barnett walking by himself to his vehicle before 9.54, getting in the vehicle, not getting out of the vehicle by then? What kind of footage do we have of where his vehicle is? That's going to be a big one. What's in the note? The fingerprints think someone could be wearing gloves. Like that's not, the, it's more did anyone witness another person at any point? Because if he, if, if he was killed somewhere other than the car, right, there would be a mess somewhere else. Like it depends on if it looks like there's the residue and all that gunshot residue, where is it? You know, this is the stuff that needs to come up, which then brings the conspiracy theorists into like, how well can we trust the Charleston PD? How well can we trust the coroner? Because of the influence Boeing has, which brings me to who could have done it. One of the biggest things you hear is like, I'm not, why would a company like that take that chance? Why would it? And the thing is, it doesn't have to be all of Boeing got together and agreed. It could be one shareholder, one person on the board, one executive, you know, who hired someone, one crazy fucking rich dude. We don't know. It doesn't have to be all of them. It could be one rogue person who was like, you know what? They heard that this testimony was really bad and they're losing money and all this shit and all these investigations going on. And they're like, I'm going to end this guy. I know a guy. It could have been something as simple as that. So just because he was killed doesn't mean it had to be several people at Boeing conspiring to kill him. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm curious, what do you guys think is the likely thing that happened here? If you ask me what I think, I tell you right now, I am 50-50 that he did it to get attention on the case or that someone took him out. And the reason they took him out was I think it was some lone like crazy wolf investor executive dude who was like, I'm ending it. I'm done. I'm just saying there's billions and billions of dollars at stake here. So anyway, let me know what you guys think. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you so much to Babel for supporting my channel. Check the link in the description and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.